Hello everyone. I hope you're doing well and keeping safe. I'm recording this from home and I think it will temporarily at least serve as an alternative to classroom teaching. It'll be a series of audio, short audio lectures. We'll see if we can do a video lecture from time to time, but hopefully this Short lectures will help you read through the novels, um, The Passion and the Mercy. Okay, so this is um, the first audio lecture, and it's going to be focused on um, part two in Janet Winters and the Passion. Um, this narrative is dominated by a female character by the name of Villanelle. Um, this part is rather short and runs from page 49 to 76, um, based on the edition I'm using. It is set in the same period, that is the year 1804, and runs parallel to the first narrative. And this is one, only one obvious similarity between the two narratives. There are several analogies we can draw between part one and part two. Well, take, for example, the fact that both characters, Henri and uh, Villanelle, are attached, I would say, fascinated and obsessed with two figures of their entourage, Napoleon Bonaparte and the Queen of Spades, in the case of Villanelle. Now, both of these characters, um, Napoleon and Queen of Spades, are depicted in the novel as charismatic, mysterious, and appealing in their different ways, of course. For Villanelle, the queen of space represents the ultimate possibility of life. A woman can attain um, a life blessed with unlimited sense of freedom and pleasure, particularly sensual pleasure. A life where man occup occupies only um, a marginal space and has little interference with um, the lady's lifestyle. Villanelle's um, life, of course, is very much influenced by this. And Villanelle prizes her sense of freedom and grows independent from her family and capable of easily slipping into the role and guise of men. Now, this fluidity of gender and ability to metamorphosize marks her quite distinctly from Henri. Henri's attachment to Napoleon, on the other hand, and we have seen this in previous classroom sessions, emanates from his sense of innocence and naivety. He's a provincial boy raised in a conservative way by his mother and by the parish priest. The war will disrupt his thick sense of innocence and bring him face to face with the grim realities of death and violence. Somehow the towering figure of Napoleon would shield the ghastly aspects of the raging imperial war. In these aspects, I would say, are vanity and greed. The final disillusionment with Napoleon will come slow and by installments, as we'll see in part three and part four. Now, the differences between the first and the second narratives are quite distinct. Venice is a cosmopolitan city, a place um, of refined culture, music and art. It has its own lifestyle and for centuries was a center of trade, crafts and industry. Religion also, form, also forms a part of the complex cultural identity of Venice. The name of the city um, evokes or calls to mind famous travelers like Marco Polo, texts like Shakespeare's play The Merchant of Venice, or even um, the poetry of uh, Lord Byron. Lord Byron has these opening lines in one of his poems, uh, Ode to um, Venice. He says, O oh, Venice, Venice, when thy marble walls are level with the waters, there shall be a cry of nations over thy sunken halls, a loud lament along the sweeping sea. 
On page 57 of uh, The Passion, um, Villanelle, in reference, reference to Venetian, states that we are philosophical people conversant with the nature of greed and desire, holding hands with the devil and God. We would not wish to let go of either. This living bridge is tempting to all, um, and you may lose your soul or find it there. Interesting. Indeed, quote. the complex identity of Venice is reflected in the makeup of Villanelle. Well, she lives with two discrepant modes of life. A woman, young and of extremely physical attraction, trying to disguise as a man. Being a woman, she's barred um, from working the boats or becoming a professional dancer. Her wet feet are a painful reminder that she cannot settle into a traditional pattern of life or the traditional female posture. Um, that is a docile housewife. When she takes a job at the casino, she conceals, she conceals, she hides her identity and changes her physical appearance. Or so it seems, for we know that um, from later incident that her disguise, her camouflage, only increases the passion of those she confronts inside the casino, the queen of spades and the cook. Both seem to have seen through her veil and found it extremely alluring to possess her body and conquer her spirit. The casino is an important space in the narrative. It represents this liberal and chartered territory where the player can seek fortune and let loose their sense of dream and fantasy. The risks of loss and bankruptcy are high obviously, but the prospects of gain is overwhelming. For Villanelle, the casino is a playground where she can meet desperate individuals seeking pleasure and solace in the sheer arbitrary order of a game of dice or cards. On a broader scale, the ongoing Napoleonic Wars are a dismal or dismal reflections of this game of dice. Did Napoleon order the crossing of the Channel despite the, the appeals of his counselors, the reasoned appeals of his advisors, that it would be too risky to try such adventure? But for him, for Napoleon, it was a risk worth taking if one envisaged eating at an Englishman's table. Now, 2,000 men were drawn on July 20th, we are told in the novel. They were replaced by new recruits the following morning, just as one can gamble and lose game of cards and try their hands and their luck again. What a striking similarity. So mm. we'll leave it there. And um, the next audio would still be focused on uh, narrative um, in part two and with this specific focus on the cook. So with that tip, I leave you and I uh, want you to keep safe and to, uh, again, uh, stay in tune uh, for um, future uh, audios on Poetry Class as well. Take care.